Hello, Working Preachers. This is Rolf Jacobson kicking off the official first day of our fall fundraising campaign. I wanted to take a moment to let you know that all gifts made during the fall campaign will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. When you make a gift during the fall campaign, November 1st through the 30th, we will send you a free ebook titled Youthful Sermons. Youthful Sermons is a workbook to help young people preach their first sermon with mentoring from their pastor. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. This is the podcast for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, November 7th, 2021. If you're looking for the podcast for All Saints, that's a different podcast, also available on workingpreacher.org. The first reading is 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16 in the thematic Old Testament uh, series. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Ruth 3, 1 through 5 and 4, 13 through 17. Uh, Psalm is Psalm 146. The second reading is Hebrews 9, 24 to 28. And the gospel reading is Mark 12, 38 to 44. Well, this is a great story. Great that it comes in November too, when some churches are trying to uh, figure out their pledges and budgeting for next year. Always good to have a little reminder of uh, religious organizations and their propensity to exploit the poor. Well, that's the that's one of the issues, right? With this passage, is uh, what what exactly is the um, the function of this story, and uh, what is it pointing out? And one uh, one possibility, of course, is uh, the way in which the widow is observed in that she gives more than her than the wealthy counterparts around her. Uh, and so calls attention to, you know, the amount and what do, what do you give and, uh, and, and that contrast, that juxtaposition between uh, she gives, you know, she gives everything she had to live on and, and what is it that others are, are, are contributing. But the other side of it is, why does she have to do that in the first place? Uh, so is this passage then also pointing out, um, is, and is Jesus pointing out that uh, the, as you said, Matt, the corruption that exists in a religious system that, that uh, requires this woman to give what she uh, is now giving. And so is it a, is it a calling attention to the, the brokenness of a, of a particular religious system. And, and I'd say there's a bit of that in our churches as well, uh, as to how, how is it that we um, extort uh, and, and, and take advantage of um, the ways in which uh, people um, imagine their relationship with the church, particularly when it comes to finances. So uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the rubs of this passage. And um, which direction you go is, is an interesting uh, thing to think about. Yeah, and I think in that too, we've got to be really clear that uh, we don't know her motive. We're right. not sure why she's doing this, if she feels compelled or if this is, and we, and I think we take Jesus seriously in his commending her. He doesn't choose her as a kind of this poor sap or anything like that. There's nothing like that going on here too. Exactly, yeah. Um, and the third thing too, I think that, that the criticism here, you mentioned a religious system and I would even narrow that a little bit more, but a certain kind of arrogance, you know, I mean, his, he's, he's never critical of people in their high regard for the law. In this case, he's not worried about the scribes being legal experts or having an interest in law observance. He goes right after their arrogance and their love for public acclaim, which is not necessarily part of their religious system, but it was how at least some people at some time inhabited it, which of course, mm-hmm. <laughs> none of us are immune to. It, it kind of comes with the calling. In so, the temptation comes with the calling in so many ways. Mm-hmm. I find also that the detail of uh, um, the, 
the fact that she, um, there's this contrast too between, um, in verse 44, between contributed out of their abundance, but out of her poverty. Uh, and, you know, what, what, what is it that Jesus is pointing to there uh, in terms of um, setting up setting up that you know again going back to what you were talking about Matt in terms of you know motivation or or uh, uh, calling attention to one's one's particular um, situation in life but I, I I do find that um, I'm not sure what to do with it but I I do find that like juxtaposition really interesting here as well. I love the fact that the the reading this week takes in that before Jesus sat in this particular location where he could watch people, so he could watch the crowd, um, he has taught. And he's taught to watch out for those who are um, recognized or wanting to be recognized and respected for their abundance. And, and so that teaching sets up uh, where Jesus chooses to sit and what Jesus chooses to watch and then where Jesus ch chooses to speak and enter in again. And uh, so for me, that is uh, just a sense of, uh, for us, don't be as impressed as we are with the celebrities, with the folks who are making all of, uh, or who have achieved all that we think uh, is worth achieving, uh, fame and fortune and uh, power, but to do what has always captured God's attention. And that is attend to the least of these, the widows, the orphans, uh, those who have, the least in society's wealth. It just seems so consistent with who God is uh, in this action of Jesus and this teaching of Jesus that I think it's worth putting it in that larger context. I think it's worth for a lot of preachers too to set this in a, in a historical context to, to add some information that the text assumes but doesn't provide, which, you know, won't be the centerpiece of your sermon, but it's what we're here for, <laughs> four of us. Uh, that there was a temple tax that Jews throughout the diaspora and the Roman world were expected to pay, and it wasn't necessarily an excessive tax, it was a contribution. And we don't have much in Jewish sources that suggest it was in any way onerous or that people hated it or resented it. So there's, we don't wanna make this into a story about taxation because I don't think that's what it primarily is. Uh, so we want to note that we want to note these scribes are probably that he's talking about are probably the Jerusalem scribes, which would suggest probably Sadducean, which would suggest probably deeply invested in the temple as not just the center of particular aspects of Israelite worship or Jew Jewish worship, but um, but also some uh, symbolic of the nation as well, and also people who are. Um, in place because of their own coordination with Roman authorities. Um, yeah, we're talking about really wealthy families. We're talking about very much the Jewish aristocratic elite of Judea. So these are people who um, make their living off of the temple, not necessarily a bad thing, say for people who are in the midst of a campaign raising money for their podcast, right? I mean, this is part of how religious organizations work. Uh, but there's something about them that, and the temple, uh, we saw that with Jesus coming in and, and the temple act uh, in, in Mark chapter 11 and other gospels. There's something about this particular system and the way these people are running it. And the gospels aren't clear exactly what the problem is, but it's deeply corrupted and it's deeply flawed. And Jesus is um, going out of his way to single out the people he thinks are responsible. Um, I think that's an, yeah. yeah. I think that's an important, uh, a really important point, Matt, because uh, of course what we don't want uh, is, or we want to be very, very cautious about is that this is Jesus at any kind of way in which uh, this could go down an anti-Semitic road uh, and, and sound as if this is a, you know, criticism of Judaism in general and the, temp the whole temple system. And that's not, that's not, that's not what's happening here. And 
how many sermons we hear that. <laughs> um, and maybe not intentionally, but can sound that way. And so it's, it's, it's that specificity, that historical specificity, I think is, is really um, a, an important corrective for what, uh, what the dynamics that Jesus is pointing out here. And particularly with the contrast of what you've named with a widow who um, is uh, in her particular, the, re the reality of widows and their plight in the first century, um, in the first century Palestine is, is uh, you know, that, that juxtaposition of recognizing that, that that's part of what we're talking about here, those extremes um, that, that, Jesus is, that Jesus is naming, which of course also exist in our, in our societies today. The scandal here is why is there a widow who has only two left uh, in her pocket? as well as why would she then decide to put it in the temple treasury? But why is there a widow living in Judea who has only two left, uh, two, two small coins? And I jump in here and with that question, Matt, uh, and say um, in some communities, that question, um, that's the very person that's in the pew. Um, those persons who, uh, particularly women, particularly single women, um, however that singleness of status is, is achieved, or, uh, are, are the ones with the least who are supporting this place um, uh, that is so central in their lives. And they're doing that uh, often ignored or dismissed uh, by the people for whom all the notoriety of the temple, of the space, uh, of, this, um, of this place in society has been pointed. And um, I, I just really appreciate you raising that question and, and setting it here because even in that question, not being asked in some congregations, this text speaks to both communities to say, um, that God is paying attention to those folks that society overlooks. Ralph, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I was gonna jump in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, um, I really appreciated a comment on the website along these lines uh, that, really, that points out, points us back to what we've been talking about all four, all fall, excuse me, in terms of discipleship in Mark and um, what the, what Mandy Bropes, you know, on the, on the website calls the cruciform existence of giving oneself. Um, I appreciated that comment. And I also want to tie in what, what you all have been saying to the longer biblical narrative that Jesus here, in terms of critiquing the temple and of calling, uh, calling for special care for the widow, stands in the long tradition, uh, going back to Isaiah and Amos, uh, who um, are very critical of the temple and who call for attention to the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner, that, that, um, that trinity of um, oppressed or not cared for people. I think especially it's important, I think, uh, in the longer tradition to recognize there's different, there are different basically statuses of widows. There's, there's widows who have large families that take care of them and and then there's widows with no children uh, and, and no system to take care of them. And you think especially maybe back to the story of Ruth, uh, which is the story of, th of three of those widows. So um, anyway, just uh, this is not anything new uh, uh, when Jesus uh, is critiquing the temple and calling our attention to the poor. And in that same vein, I appreciate that, Rolf, in that same vein, scripture is written directly to the people of God. Uh, and so um, we make a mistake when we uh, fall into that anti-Semitic language, um, because at the point where we want to write off the Jews, um, the finger is really pointing at us who claim to be the people of God. Uh, so I appreciate earlier uh, the recognition that the anti-Semitic reading that ha has so often been um, the focus uh, is, a, is missing the fact that it's the very people who claim to be the people of God who are the ones whose attitude is most problematic 
and whose actions are called into account. Would it be worth going to um, the other widow uh, that's being noted here? The other woman? We need another widow story. What are we going to choose? How about 1 Kings 17? Got a <laughs> that's widow a in good it. one. That's a good one. I love I that one. I, you know what? I do like it when this happens because I, I, it, I don't have to work so hard to figure out what's the connection again. Um, what, what, how, why was this passage picked? To Not just go a along widow. With the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Not just a oh, widow, widow, but, but here's a, here's a needy man who believes he's been called by God to have a woman take care of him. <laughs> so it's like, okay, the... <laughs> that is so true. That is I... so not what this story's about. <laughs> well, thank you, Rob. I know it's not well, about it. Well, go but... ahead, but go ahead, Caroline. Uh, I, I, this story, I, I don't know. Um, I really, I'm having a problem with it this time around. I know, I know what it's all about. And I know it's not, it, it's not what it, I know this is not what it means, but, uh, but this, um, I don't know this, uh, yes, Elijah goes to her and that's, you know, it's, it's this, uh, this moment of um, dependence and uh, and and uh, the way in which God is guiding this reality and uh, and that there ends up being a kind of reciprocity and mutuality in this relationship. I see all of that. Uh, I, but I'm not I'm not convinced that the that the widow knows. Uh, what this is all about, and I hear in this in this situation a kind of vulnerability that really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, that that she's asked to give up, give things that what makes us think that 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 she has a level of trust here uh, that we sort of anticipate or assume from the story, and um, and it from a from a. Uh, from a perspective of uh, the vulnerability of women and expectation of women to uh, take care of <laughs> a situation or to be asked to do things that are outside of um, outside of what they're capable of, I that's the perspective I had this time around, and it's um, it's it just that's where I was. So, so one of the hard things about dropping into the middle of these longer narratives about characters in the Bible is that um, most listeners to sermons uh, don't aren't able to contextualize them. So this is, a, this is the uh, second piece of the Elijah story, which is part of the longer narrative of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel in Northern Israel. So so. Jezebel and Ahab have brought, because Jezebel is from where? She's from Sidon. Let's just keep that in mind for a second. So King Ahab marries Jezebel, who is not, uh, does not worship Yahweh, and brings the worship of Baal, along with um, the sorts of self-harm and uh, child sacrifice, according to the biblical narrative. You can credit that or not if you want. Um, and then Elijah, uh, whose call story is not reported, um, declares a drought. And then when God sends him first to be taken care of by the ravens, which are either ravens who feed him, you know, what ravens feed their young, um, or they are, uh, they are Bedouins, that is non-Yahwists, that uh, he has, uh, so he has to rely on their hospitality. And then after the water runs out in the first story, he is sent to Sidon, so this, this widow is not Yahweh, and she's from the very people that um, have, uh, whose queen has brought um, the worship of Baal into Israel. And throughout the Old Testament, you see a lot of xenophobia. Uh, so after the exile, part of this, you know, the, all the foreign wives and their children are sent away. So I want to think about this story in that context. And Elijah must rely on the hospitality of this foreign woman who uh, is a widow and has little. And through this, abundance will be created and eventually her son is uh, resuscitated. 
I don't know if that has anything to do with uh, your guys' argument about Lazarus uh, but, uh, from a different podcast, but uh, her son is resuscitated. Thinking about, I want to think about like pastors who make calls on people um, in their homes. And are you tempted to call on the people that have a lot and, who, and whose way of blessing you is to really set out excellent food out of their plenty? Or are you called to go to the person who has little and will off, but will bless you with what I'm just going to I'll say he has, uh, and, and that we are called to go and rely on the hospitality of people who are different from us. And in that, even think about this, even uh, God is working, even when we rely on the hospitality of people who don't share our faith and who have little, but in those moments, maybe God's bigger blessing than when we go to our own who have plenty. Just trying to flip it a little bit. I appreciate that, Rolf. Uh, and I also appreciate the, the, the reading, the perspective that you laid out, Caroline. Um, for me, as I was reading it, uh, as often as the case, particularly when I'm reading an Old Testament passage, is just noting the fact that this extension of hospitality is a woman. Um, that that you know th that's central to this text. That I have so often been told as a woman, I'm supposed to find trouble in reading. And like here it is, God says, um, you're going to go, and the person that's going to uh, be the source of of your substance sustenance is um, oh wait a minute, it's a girl. And um, uh, as you've clearly called our attention to, Rolf. Uh, it's a foreigner, it's a widow, it's the least of these in all of the categories. Uh, and, uh, and yet that juxtaposition that enables us to say, um, this is a person that's gonna feed you. And in the midst of a drought, he says, bring me some water. And um, then she says, and this really jumps out at you when you remember, she is not a, God, a worshiper of Yahweh. As the Lord, your God lives. I've got no, no food. <laughs> you, know, you, you ask for water and then you move on to ask for bread. I, that I don't have. Uh, and yet Yahweh, uh, excuse me, Elijah is able to say, um, it's okay. Uh, you 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 can go ahead and make a little cake for me and bring it to me and that promise for her as we've noted the outsider the least of these the promise of Yahweh is for her as well and can we pay attention to that that the promise of God is for those we think are othered and if we're going to experience the hospitality of God, we're going to have to be willing to receive that from those we would other. I, I find that a challenging text in and of itself without having to, um, to just do the male-female dynamic here. Let's move to Ruth, uh, which is the semi-continuous um, text. And it's actually maybe a better pairing with the widow story, uh, even though it's not trying to pair it because it's semi-continuous. So um, for those who uh, had the 23rd Sunday of Pentecost last week and maybe talked about Ruth, it's the opening chapter, which ends with um, especially these two widows clinging to each other. Uh, such a beautiful story of Hesed, I think it's the best, I think the book of Ruth is the best story of what Hesed looks like uh, in the Old Testament. And now you jump to um, sort of the first, the middle, and then the end of the story uh, with um, chapter three, um, which is uh, the threshing uh, floor story. And um, then the end uh, with this, a uh, beautiful line um, that says, um, blessed be the Lord who has not left you, talking now, to, um, talking now to Naomi, who has not left you 
without next of kin, the next of kin really comes through Ruth. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons. Now, now think about that. The daughter-in-law, Ruth, is more to Naomi than seven sons. Uh, the power of that beautiful line and uh, the way these two widows clung to each other uh, and, and um, found salvation for each other. They were salvation for each other before Boaz was. And frankly, Ruth is salvation to Boaz. I appreciate that, um, Rolf. That's really going to be helpful for me. I'm actually going to be preaching on this, and I'm going to be preaching from the Ruth story, and uh, I'm calling it Radical Redemption. Um, and, and it's basically recognizing that same line that you just pulled out, that um, here is the least expected place to find the source of salvation, the source of hope, the source of redemption. And it's pitted against or put up against what is supposed to be the greatest source, seven sons, that promise of a future that you have there. And actually, no, that promise of a future has been experienced radically in a place we didn't expect it. Thanks for that. Can I say one more thing about this story? And it's in a part of the story that's left out, uh, but it is so important. And I don't know if I'm going to be quickly able to find the exact uh, line. Uh, here it is. It's, it's, it's in 4-6. Uh, before Boaz can marry Ruth, um, because of the laws of the time, uh, a relative who is more closely related to Naomi's dead husband uh, Elimelech is uh, first has the chance and he's going to do it to take the land until he finds out he has to um, procreate with Ruth, who is over and over called the Moabite. Uh, so Boaz says, hey, if you if you get the field, you are also acquiring Ruth, the Moabite. Again, it, uh, Israel's uh, xenophobia, uh, especially post exile, when all the foreign wives are cast out by Ezra. And then it says this, that, so then this next of kin who's never named says, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. The word inheritance um, actually here really means lineage. Uh, uh, so that is without corrupting my genetic line. And so, I mean, thinking back, you know, to, uh, um, excuse me, the mark in reading uh, that, and also reflecting on 1 Kings 17, that this Ruth is really protest literature here. It's a piece of protest literature against, especially some of the post-exilic norms that took hold because of leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah. Let me just add one thing uh, for kind of a for preachers to be aware of and think about as, as they craft sermons on this. Um, in my teaching, I get in a lot of conversations with people, whether students or people in congregations and around uh, passages that didn't go the way somebody thought they would or passages that, that bring up a, a variety of emotions and responses. Uh, and Ruth three is definitely one of those uh, people who have experienced human trafficking, uh, have been trafficked, have got uh, daughters or sons who have been trafficked uh, will, in my experience, have a, a very difficult time with um, what Naomi instructs Ruth to do. So use a lot of care in talking about that, that scene and what's going on. Sometimes people make it humorous and, and kind of titillating. And I just would say, be really, really careful about uh, how you choose your words and how you describe what's taking place there. Because, yeah. <laughs> it's easy yeah. to read this as Ruth being trafficked by her mother-in-law. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Matt. Indeed. Praise okay. the Lord, oh my soul. Well, the Psalm 146. Uh, there's an orphan in it and a widow. There's a widow. So, woohoo! I am really like making the connections today. I am on. 
with thank uh, you for finding that for me yeah figuring out what the what yeah what the connection is so i um yeah that's that's great <laughs> i don't know if i have much to say about the psalm other than that that's obviously the connection but uh yeah i mean it's uh it's a praise psalm right rolf <laughs> yes Woo-hoo! It's a after, praise psalm. After I've got that and made that connection too. I'm, I'm on it today. It's a praise psalm that reminds us that is a testimony, first of all, that one of the roles of praise is praise is testimony. And this is the, uh, it's testimony that uh, God is active in the world. And in our post-enlightenment world in which we have often reduced um, the creed to a series of pro- uh, theological propositions to which we give intellectual assent. Um, what this does is it takes essentially uh, elements of Israel's uh, ancient creedal fragments or creed-like fragments, uh, and it says, this is who God is. God is active in the world. He executes justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, sets prisoners free, opens the eyes of the blind, lifts up those who are bound down. And you ought to be able to look out there in the world, the Psalm says, and you ought to be able to discern God's agency and activity. And if you can't do that, then maybe um, you have uh, reduced God to a set of ideas in which you believe, but you're actually not participating in a living God's actions in the world. So I love this Psalm. If you're reading the Hebrews text and wondering, isn't this the one that we had assigned last week? Uh, you're, you're experiencing the book of Hebrews, which has a way of cycling back and restating things with greater intensity. It's If you were to, to graph out the rhetoric of this book, it would it'd be a lot of loops and circles and, and callbacks. But um, so we're still in this series. I, I, would, I would just want to point out one thing is in, with all the sacrificial language of Hebrews, and all of the, the uh, I was gonna say illusions, but maybe more explicit connections to Yom Kippur uh, and other kinds of liturgies and, and we see in the Old Testament, it's, it never describes Christ's death as again, a payment or as a satisfaction of an angry God. It just simply says that the death is effective, just like a sacrifice is seen to be effective. And I would say that instead of trying to get into the mechanics or the mathematics of why that's so, it's because, um, because God is always faithful to forgive. Uh, and that's true back in the Yom Kippur, um, um, that's what I want, commands, I guess, uh, that we read about in Leviticus. That's one of the amazing things, right? Is that, okay, now a holy God will continue to dwell with God's people. I mean, God has always been forgiving The point Hebrews is trying to make is that the death of Christ operates in that same vein, but now in a kind of once for all sort of way. So just to, again, help people, help steer people away from some bad theology or to correct ways in which they've made perhaps unhelpful assumptions. 